And go ahead, Doug, thank you. All right, uh, welcome folks. Thanks for joining us. We're here to chat about grassland birds and grassland bird habitat in Vermont today. So first off, a few points of housekeeping. So we're in the Microsoft Teams application, which is pretty similar to many of the other uh, video and meeting applications out there. You should have a little toolbar uh, probably on the bottom of your screen. You'll notice there are a video and microphone icon, which now would be a good point to uh, turn off your videos and mute your microphones. Uh, and also there's a chat button. So that little box on the right will open a chat window. And in there, if you'd like to right now, you could put um, introduce yourself, you know, put your name, maybe where you're from or whatever relevant affiliation you may have. Um, and the chat window will also be important because that's where we'll take questions from. So anytime you have a question as we go, feel free to just put it right in the chat and then we'll uh, take it out of there. We'll have breaks periodically. We'll have four different sections in this presentation and we'll do breaks at the end of each one. So we'll take chats out of the wind window at that point and uh, we will answer questions then. So a uh, brief introduction. Uh, my name is Doug Moore and I'm the bird project leader for the state of Vermont. And then uh, Jens Hilke is the uh, co-host here. Jens is with the Community Wildlife Program uh, as a conservation planner. And we also have Lincoln and a couple other staff with us as well. So the topics for today are our sections are grassland bird ecology, management practices, conservation efforts, and what towns are doing. So as a little intro here, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, the mission is the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. So it's a very broad mission. It encompasses the conservation of all wild things out there. And as a result, we work at a variety of scales from the smallest little critters and plants to the largest habitats. And we also work with a variety of people. So wildlife watchers, uh, hunters and fishermen to local communities and landowners. So we'll jump right in with our first section here on grassland bird ecology. So grassland bird species we have <clears throat> in the ballpark of 10 species, depending on how you want to define it, uh, of species that really rely on these grasslands for their needs. So that's what it means to be a grassland bird, is you won't see them in the forest, you won't see them in shrubby areas, you won't see them in wetlands. They're really relying on grasslands. Uh, so the primary four species, the ones you're most likely to see, would be bobolink, which is in the top left corner, and he's got the little tuxedo on there, black and white. Uh, Eastern meadowlark in the top right corner with the beautiful yellow color on the chest. Savannah sparrow, which is in the middle left, um, little brown job. And then we have northern harrier, which is a raptor. Right. So those are in the bolded boxes. Going down our number list, we have American kestrel, which is maybe a little less tied to grasslands than most of the other species. It's a little more flexible. And then the last species, upland sandpiper, grasshopper sparrow, vesper sparrow, et cetera, those species are all only gonna occur in Vermont in very limited numbers. Some of them we haven't even seen in the state in a number of years. Um, so some of those species are really quite rare. So those four top ones are the ones that are kind of the most common that we're going to be discussing. And you can see the parentheses there, the T and E, so threatened or endangered. Uh, notably, Eastern Meadowlark was just added to the list of Vermont endangered species. Uh, its classification is threatened, uh, and that just happened this year. <clears throat> so when we say grasslands, um, we mean birds that require this kind of habitat, a open grassy field um, in Vermont for the most part that means a hay field. Uh, these birds are predominantly ground nesting birds so they are nesting and living right in uh, on the ground in those hay fields or pastures. There's some slight differences in the types of 
uh, habitat they like, the types of grasslands. So harriers like kind of wet meadow, lowlandy areas. Grasshopper sparrows like drier, more sparsely vegetated areas. But for the most part, they all have this commonality around these open grassy areas. So there's a long history of these species in the state. Uh, on the left here, there's a map of 18,000 years before the present. So the big crosshatched white area, that's the Laurentide ice sheet covering Canada or a big chunk of eastern Canada there. And then what we have in the Northeast and through the lake states was a, a community they called the Spruce Fir Parkland. And in that community, when, when that community was present on the landscape, there were fossil, or not fossil records, but uh, there were physical evidence of upland sandpipers being present. So that's one of our current grassland bird species that's still in the states. And right below our picture of the upland sandpiper in the bottom right, that's a current range map of upland sandpiper. So you can see its core habitat is really those northern Great Plains state, but it's got little chunks that extend over into the northeast. So things have changed a lot for these species over time and, and will continue to change, but we do have them here at the present. So this is what we might think of when we think of grassland birds is these upper Great Plains, tall grass and mixed prairie in the Midwestern US, South Central Canada. And you can see that's true for the core range of some of these species. So here's Eastern Meadowlark, uh, big core in the, in the lower Great Plains states, but extending all the way out to the far Northeast and then down even to Central and South America. So this is all breeding habitat range. And then grasshopper sparrow here. So kind of all over the Great Plains states and then extending through the East Coast and again up to the Northeast. <clears throat> now, the issue that these species have run into with their core range in those Plains states is the loss of their, what has been their native habitat for, for many years. So we only have about 4% of native tall grass prairie remaining, which is the dark green there in Kansas and Oklahoma, um, as compared to the lighter green, which is where those communities used to be. And then we've got less than 50% of our native short grass prairie remaining, which is the kind of bold orange color to the west, as opposed to the larger rusty orange light color where that community used to be. So we've lost a huge amount of this habitat over the last few hundred years. And this is what some of that looks like. So this is a conversion from uh, you know, a large Midwestern hayfield to a cropping system for biofuels in this case. So that large chunk went from grassland bird habitat to not grassland bird habitat. <clears throat> so here's our friend, the bobolink. Um, you can see again a strong concentration, in this case, kind of the upper plains in the Midwest, uh, but actually really significant populations extending to the east. So we have as much as 20% of the bobbling population in the Northeast and New York and kind of over to some of the Great Lakes area. And the other finding is that we have really good productivity here for bobbling and some of the other grassland birds. So when they do breed here, they tend to do pretty well. Um, now, in the east with the natural processes that would have created open land, so things like fire and beavers, many of those processes have been suppressed over time, so they're really not creating much open land anymore. So agriculture has become the natural home for these birds um, in the east. And as a result, <clears throat> of this habitat loss, as well as other factors, we can see here a graph of uh, kind of birds in North America very broadly um, grouped by their habitats. And if you'll notice the second to the bottom, kind of in the tan there is grassland birds. So negative 34%. So they are declining. More of their species are declining than other groups of birds, and more of them are declining faster than other groups of birds. The only group that beats them are called tipping point species, and those species are uh, particularly pulled out because they are declining so fast. So when we're thinking about groups of birds um, as their habitats, grassland birds are really at the top of the list. Worldwide, we've lost about 70% of grasslands um, to agriculture, 
So habitat loss is a primary factor in this, but there are some others as well. So the opportunity we have here is that we have species present and we have species that are producing um, chicks well, they are, they're reproducing well. So it's an opportunity for us to um, try to support these species where they exist. Now in Vermont and in the US broadly, these are summer species. So on the left, these are charts for bobolink. Again, on the left, the map, the red is showing breeding territories. The yellow is migrating, and then the blue is wintering. So bobolinks have an extremely long migration going from the northern portion of the US down to South America. <clears throat> but what you can see here on the right, this is a chart of at what time in the year are bobolinks being sighted. And basically it's May through August, maybe September. So these species only spend a few months in the US or in Vermont. <clears throat> and then they migrate back down, spend the winter in South America, migrate back up in the spring. And the reason they're doing that is to take advantage of this flush of insects that comes every summer. So, uh, you know, whenever we start getting upset about the black flies and the mosquitoes that are around, those birds are getting excited because there's caterpillars to start feeding their young. So they're up here specifically for the breeding season. So where do they occur in Vermont? We have Eastern Meadowlark here on the left, um, showing not as many points on the map as Bobolink on the right. So Eastern Meadowlark are relatively more rare and strong concentrations in the Champlain Valley, a little bit in the Connecticut River. You see the same basic signature with Bobolink, but they do, they are more common, so they tend to, to be a little more widely distributed. Also a number of points up near kind of the Memphremagog area. And then we have Northern Harrier on the left and Grasshopper Sparrow on the right. So Grasshopper Sparrow, extremely limited distribution, basically limited to a few airports and similar facilities in the state. Northern Harrier, more widely distributed, but same kind of broad pattern. If you look at most of the points being in the Champlain Valley and then some of them pulling up towards those open lands in the Memphremagog area. And that's kind of what we'd expect when we look at the satellite imagery here. So this is just a satellite image of the state of Vermont, and you can kind of see all those open lands in the Champlain Valley. And we know these birds want grasslands, so we can actually see basically from space the landscapes in which these birds are, are going to prefer. Uh, on the right, you can see if we zoom in a little bit, it's not just you know, broadly speaking, the open lands they want, but within an open landscape, they want areas that are open. So you're going to you're going to get this as a theme today is these grassland birds are going to intentionally select for kind of the most open landscapes, the most open portions of those landscape, and then within that, the most open fields they can. Because a lot of their evolution was in those kind of prairie areas where things were just wide open and they could see all the way to the horizon. So they actually have a selection for that kind of characteristic. So when we get down to the field level, we're still looking for that as a theme. So within an open landscape, we're looking for large fields and open fields, by which I mean few obstructions. So in this case, we have one big tree out there, maybe an elm or something or a poplar, um, but not all kinds of big hedgerows and shrubs sticking out. Um, those things are less preferred. So with this, on the left, the red boundary is a delineation of kind of the open areas. So we're selecting all the field areas. And then the green within that is kind of the core of that field. And the designation there is these grassland birds are only going to breed within areas that are more like the green. So they're not going to breed right on the edge of the field next to the forest. They are grassland birds, so they want big open grasslands. And if they're pushed into a smaller field or if they choose a smaller field, they're gonna push away from those forest edges. And there may be a variety of reasons from that, um, you know, more predators working along those edges, something like that. But we can observe this as, as being factually true when we are out there doing field work and noting where they're nesting. So the result we can take from that is those long skinny fields, like on the right, that red uh, diagram of a field 
or the yellow one where the field is all intertwined with these edges, those tend to be less preferred. When you have more edges and narrower fields, you're going to have less of that core space. So what we really want are those big blocky fields with a lot of core field area. So not only the size and the landscape, but also the shape of the field will affect how much the birds want to be there. And then the composition of the field. So we call them grassland birds, and it turns out mostly they like grasses. They will tolerate a mix of other species or sometimes prefer a few other species in there. Uh, <clears throat> but primarily we're talking about grasses, not woody plants, so not having shrubs, not having trees, and also not having invasive plants. And we'll talk about um, invasive plants some more during this webinar. So this is an example of something that we might call a meadow. So it looks really open and you might think, oh, this is great for those open land birds. But we can see here, this is actually mostly goldenrod and other forbs, non grassy herbaceous things. And we have some trees entering. So the birds are gonna start pushing away from those trees, those vertical obstructions. So this picture here is not actually grassland bird habitat. Now, the ultimate litmus test for what is or is not grassland bird habitat is, are the birds there? Have they chosen that? Because all of our principles are just a reflection of where we're finding the birds. If we're finding the birds breeding in a habitat, then that for certain is grassland bird habitat. There's some nuance to that because early or late in the season, the birds may not be nesting there. They may be kind of moving through or hanging out and feeding. So it depends on exactly the time of year you're seeing them and what they're doing. So this picture here is a, a male bobolink on the left in that uh, you know dark black tuxedo outfit. And then this is a female on the right with the more drab yellow olive. So she's not having to advertise herself to her potential mates. Um, so she doesn't need to take the risk of sporting that bright coloration. So she's better off being camouflaged. So in this case, when we see males and females together, or particularly when we see, you know, females carrying food, things like that, then we can know for sure that they're nesting in that field. Okay, so this is our first section break. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. We'll be happy to try to answer them now. Uh, and then we'll continue moving on through our other sections. All right, Doug, I do see a question here from Carol Blackwood, um, wondering how they can make their horse pasture more bird friendly. Great, that's an excellent question. Uh, so the next topic is actually going to be managing uh, for grassland birds. So we will we will cover most of that and if you still have questions more particularly at the end of that section, then throw them in the chat box and we'll get to those. And I guess one, one thing to note there is mostly in this next section, I'll be talking about mowing because cutting hay is the most frequent way to preserve these fields, uh, but the same principles apply to pasture. So if you have uh, grazing animals out there, it's basically the same principles. That's all from the chat at this time. All right, well, we'll jump into the next question on managing and planning for grassland birds. So that was a perfect segue for a question. So why do grassland birds need management in Vermont? Uh, number one, so we've, we've noted these declines, uh, but why is it important that we do something for them here? Uh, so the first thing is that habitat is very limited. So from that satellite image, you. You will have seen agriculture in Vermont is something around 10 or 15 percent of the landscape. The proportion of that, which is viable hay fields or pasture for grassland birds, is even less. So it's a small portion of the land. The grasslands themselves are ephemeral. So if we're not out there uh, knocking back the forbs or the shrubs and the trees, then the hay fields and the pastures are going to disappear. They're going to succeed onto other vegetation. Uh, grassland habitat is, is desirable for development. It's often fairly flat and clear, makes things easy. Uh, it's prone to changes in agricultural use. So anything from intensifying the haying, which we'll talk about if it's hayed three or four times a year, that's not very good for grassland birds. Or if it's changed from a hay field into cornfield, that's no longer useful for grassland birds. 
And then lastly, the birds themselves are vulnerable when they're nesting. So I mentioned that these are ground nesting birds, so they are stuck on their nest in the middle of the field for you know a couple weeks, uh, going on a couple months in the middle of the summer. So some principles when we're thinking about managing for grass and birds, and we'll go in each of these more in depth. So choosing the right places to work, maintaining or creating large open grasslands, mowing outside of the breeding season, and minimizing disturbance during the breeding season. So choosing the right places to work, this is basically what I just covered in the kind of ecology intro about habitats that birds are choosing. So when we're trying to go out of our way to help grassland birds, let's do it in the places that are most preferred for grassland birds. So those tend to be large open landscapes, large fields within the open landscapes, and primarily composed of grasses, not invasive species. So <clears throat> it's going to be a lot more beneficial uh, in the long term to try to preserve these places that have the right characteristics than it is to really fight against a situation where you have a small field and it's in the middle of the woods and it's got all these shrubby things coming up. You can work on that, but it's never going to have the potential of something that's in one of these large open landscapes and, and has some of these characteristics. So, you know, just prioritizing where we place our effort. And then maintaining or creating large open grasslands. So this is kind of the key of the habitat we're looking for. Uh, so different sizes, oh, sorry about that, uh, different sizes for different species. So bobolinks, you can see in the bottom left of that figure, they accept kind of the smallest field size of about 10 acres, but really they'd like more than that. That's that's really their minimum for, you know, a couple pairs. Um, as we go up through eastern meadowlarks, grasshopper sparrows, upland sandpipers, we're talking about many dozens of acres, a um, hundred and more acres for a small number, even a single number of pairs for things like upland sandpipers and harriers. And the ideal would be to create blocks of this grassland habitat. So just like we talk about forest blocks or habitat blocks, uh, those of you in the in municipal planning community who are familiar with the Vermont conservation design, we still want to think about grassland in a similar way. So big blocks of this preferred grassland habitat. And just like with forest blocks, we don't want to plop our house or our development right in the exact center of that block because that's going to reduce the quality of that whole big area. So if we can keep any development around the edges, that would be ideal. So again, maintaining or creating open habitat, open grasslands. Um, so instead of maintaining, now we're talking creating. So we have a before and after picture on the right where uh, this was a project in Massachusetts where they removed these wooded fence rows between fields and really you can see how much that opened up the area and on the left you can see an example of a, a parcel you know note this would not be one of our top priorities because it is really hemmed in by that woods all around the sides and it's long and skinny but if we did want to increase the potential for grass and birds there we can see these wooded uh, stone walls that are intermediate breaking up these fields into five to eight acre fields if we took out all of those trees on the stone walls, we'd have a contiguous block of 30, 40 acres. So that would be much more preferable to most species, even though it's still not an ideal setting. So mowing outside the breeding season. So mowing is required or some kind of disturbance is required. Um, you know, historically it could have been fire or beavers. Now it's mowing or pasture. Um, so again, this is what we call a meadow and it's not really grass and bird habitat. So at one point this may have been grass and then these forbs, these other species have grown up. So mowing too little can be a problem for grass. At the same time, these are ground nesting birds and we know they're here, like I mentioned, from basically May through August, which is prime haymaking season. So mowing during the active nesting season presents an obvious conflict because we don't want to, you know, chop these birds up in our mowers and run them over with our tractors. That's not going to help anybody either. So mowing too much and mowing too little can be a problem. So when do we want to mow? 
The ideal time would be to wait until after August 15th. That's kind of our farthest out there. All the birds are done nesting at that point. It's very safe. Uh, so that's illustrated on the calendar on the left hand side of the screen there. So the red is showing dates when we should stay away from mowing or intensive grazing. Uh, and then on the right, we can see a chart. So this is for Bobolink and Savannah Sparrow showing the percentage of nests that have fledged over the course of the season. So you can see the nests start fledging in this, and this is for the Northeast. So this is, you know, into June and July, we're getting a number of nests and we really peak towards mid to late July and then even right around early August. So this is why we tell people if you want to manage specifically for grassland birds, the idea would be, you know, August 15th is the safest possible thing. Everybody pretty much is done. August 1st is really great. If you need to mow before then, if you're looking at something like mid-July, that can be pretty reasonable and a lot of birds can be done, but not all of them will be. So there will be some nest loss. Anything like that would be preferable to mowing during June uh, when you'd be wiping out all of the early in progress nests. There is one exception to this uh, <clears throat> or one possible option for farmers that really need to get multiple cuts of hay off a field or maybe you're grazing and you really need to be moving your animals through the field. Uh, there's an option where if you can get your first cut of hay or your first grazing done during or before June 1st, excuse me, so that's during the month of May, then wait 65 days, which puts you into mid-August, then you do your second. So your, your first cutting of hay will lose some nests during that process, nests that have just started, but it's so early in the process, those adults will re-nest. So the adult birds mostly will fly off the nest, they'll lose the eggs, that's not the end of the world, they'll create another nest later. Uh, they still have time in the season to do that because it's nice and early. So that option is cutting during the month of May and then waiting 65 days until mid-August before you start again. And that 65 day period gives them enough time to restart and then finish their nests. That's something that we really only target towards farmers who are really pushing the need to extract the hay from that field. Um, otherwise, if, if we're just talking about landowners, then basically mowing or grazing later in the season is better. Now, there are some considerations with this. Um, <clears throat> so collecting the hay at least every few years can be important. Allowing that thatch of hay to remain on the field tends to prefer other species to grasses. Some of those forbs will come in. It changes the nutrient cycling a little bit. Um, the reason why that can be tricky is that farmers often find delayed mowing undesirable. So the quality of the hay is considerably lower because all of those plants have gone to seed. So the nutrition is very different. Uh, and late mowing can encourage non-grasses and invasive plants to move in because everything's going to seed. Anything in that field is going to be successfully propagating itself. Whereas if we're cutting it multiple times a year, then the grasses are going to be uh, out competing everything else. So this strategy of moving to a, a late mowing only, you know, in, in August or afterwards is going to introduce some complications. It may be harder to find someone to do the job and it may prefer those non-grass and invasive plants, which we really don't want in the long term. So the best case there is, you know, manage it for birds for as long as we can. If you have any problems like non-grass plants or invasive plants moving in, then you can take a year off if you need to and mow it more intensively, do some kind of treatment for the plants, the undesirable plants that have moved in. But every situation is different and there's not always an easy solution for finding a farmer or finding someone who can cut the hay off the property. So the last item here, last kind of principle of managing for grass, grassland birds is minimizing disturbance during the breeding season. So humans, dogs, events, um, anything like that, a lot of these birds are very sensitive, so they can and will abandon their nests uh, if their dog's running out in the field. If your beautiful grassland becomes the town fair in July, that's no longer grassland bird habitat. And then 
keeping domestic cats indoors. Domestic cats probably kill more birds than any other human cause combined. Um, so please keep them inside, especially in these grassland habitats. The birds are ground nesting. The fields are often interspersed with houses nearby, so they're very susceptible to predators like domestic cats. OK, we're at a section break here, so our, our next section will be about conservation efforts. So again, if you have any more questions, I have seen a few things pop up in the chat bar. I'm not sure if they're questions, but we have an opportunity right now. Yeah, Doug, uh, Carol made a comment that you started to address there, but mowing that late allows non-grass annuals to flower and seed is, is what Carol brought up. Yes, and that's unfortunately true. Um, so it's certainly possible. I mean, you could move to trying to do an early cut before June 1st and then the later one, mowing multiple times later in the season. Um, it's unfortunately just kind of a hard truth of these birds that they need that 65 day window during the season. Um, so it's it comes down to managing each individual field and seeing what happens. Great, thanks. And um, Tara's, Tara's asking just about the beginning part, number one of the presentation. We're going to make this slide. This is going to be a recorded uh, webinar. We'll make these slides available after. So if you came in late, don't worry, we'll get you this recording. Uh, so you can watch it in full. Great. Is yeah. that it for questions? I think so. Yep. Section Excellent. Three. So kind of current conservation efforts going on in the state. <clears throat> uh, grassland birds uh, in some cases have regulatory protections. Those threatened and endangered species that I listed up front. Um, each of them is protected as an endangered species. And then any projects that fall under Act 250 or Section 248, which is energy related, um, those projects are assessed for impacts to grassland bird habitat, but we don't need to get into the details there. Voluntary conservation projects. Um, so this, these are pretty exciting projects. There's the Bobolink project. And then there's uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, is a branch of the USDA. So Bobble Inc. is a non-governmental organization. It's a partnership including UVM um, and Mass Audubon and Audubon Vermont and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department um, does cooperate with them to an extent. So Bobble Inc. and NRCS both have landowner incentive programs. So basically acknowledging that this can be more expensive to do it this way, especially if you're a farmer or if you're leasing your land to a farmer um, and the money is an important aspect of this. Um, each of these sets up a, an economic incentive whereby a landowner can get paid in order to do this kind of delayed mowing. So it's recognizing that you're giving up some of the economic value on this land, but the value in bird habitat is important to us, so, we're, so we'll pay you a certain amount. Um, the values can change right now. I think the Bobolink project is around $60 per acre per year, and NRCS is around $150 per acre per year. So the, the federal payment is quite a bit higher, but it's quite a bit harder to get into that program. There's the, the federal bureaucracy of applying for an NRCS project. Um, and those NRCS projects are under what's called the EQIP program, E-Q-I-P, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. But the short story there is if you're a landowner who's interested in this or you know a farmer who's interested in this, this is a way to get some of that economic value back while doing this management that's good for grassland birds. Um, if you're just an interested party and you want to help support this work, you can donate to the Bobolink project so you can look that up. Um, and then the other local set of local conservation efforts at the bottom, I have this picture. This is a, a Middlebury Area Land Trust project where they conserved a bunch of grassland habitat. So local land trusts, statewide land trusts um, do a lot of work in the agriculture and grassland section. So uh, supporting those organizations and uh, helping them with grassland bird specific management can be really important. And then habitat management at a landowner scale. Um, so we have the Department of Fish and Wildlife on the left here. This is the cover of a book that we produced a number of years ago, A Landowner's Guide to Wildlife Habitat in Vermont, which is uh, a free 
uh, free guides. So we have physical copies that are available in most of the district offices, or it's all available online. And I think we'll stick a link to that in the chat. Uh, but there's a guide specifically to managing for grass and birds in there. So that can be really useful. Uh, some other resources, uh, Vermont Coverts uh, is a project and a little more focused on woodland management, but really takes a wide um, lens, a wide view of wildlife management in Vermont and specifically for landowners. And the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, VCE, has some outreach materials and some staff time devoted towards um, grassland habitat management. They've been coordinating some Eastern Meadowlark surveys. So really great to see more efforts around these species. And then this little blobby picture here showing the different acreages is just making the point that landowners with adjacent acreages working together, managing things, um, can create a larger effective habitat size than people working alone. So this is the kind of message that Vermont Coverts talks about a lot is, ways landowners can work with other landowners to achieve these larger goals. OK, that's the, the last of my section. So the next section, I think Jens will give us a little tour of what some towns are doing in the state. Uh, are there any questions before I yield the floor to Jens? OK, um, yeah, a lot of good links coming into the chat and we do have um, a question here from Tara. We struggled with the mo late for breeding versus invasive control for better habitat. Do individual birds return to the same field? I'm wondering if changing the approach from time to time would impact them or field or the field is not big enough to mow only part. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point, Tara, that one one way to accommodate you know, invasive plants or some undesirable habitat condition you're having is to mow part of the field more intensively. So you might do it two, three, four times a year to try to knock back some vegetation to get the grasses back in there in uh, more density. Um, and you can leave the other half of the field as, as delayed mode breeding habitat. Um, it sounds like in your case, maybe that's not an option. Um, <clears throat> Lincoln, could you remind me of the beginning of that question? <laughs> yeah, so um, they've struggled with the uh, mo late for breeding versus invasive. Oh, control. they're just just having trouble with the invasives, right? Um, do, do the birds yeah, return to the same? Then, time? right. Thank you. Do the individuals return? So they do have a high level of of what's called site fidelity. So they will often come back to the same site, um, either individual birds or relatives thereof. Um, and good breeding sites tend to stay good breeding sites if they're being managed um, appropriately. Um, you know, that being said, all right, you know, the, the invasive problem is a hard one and there's no easy answer there. And it's something that folks are struggling with everywhere. Um, you know, if we lose that habitat and if that becomes a field of parsnip, or a field of chervil or something, that's no longer habitat for the birds. So I think at some point, if those species are really getting in there, those plant species are getting in there, um, or bed straw, if the bed straw is totally taking over, I mean, they'll tolerate a level of it, but if it's totally taking over and you're seeing bird numbers decline, then maybe that's the time where you do need to intervene. And typically that's either gonna be, from what I've seen, that's either gonna be more intensive mowing for a year or two, or uh, you know a pesticide treatment um, targeting those individual plants um, those are you know some people have tried grazing options those can be pretty tough um, intensive grazing uh, but basically anything you can to return that field to a more heavily grass condition great and then there's a, another question for marianne just about what is the most prevalent species in the northeast kingdom highland area most prevalent grass and bird species? I believe so. Yep. Yeah, it's probably bobolinks. Um, bobolinks and savanna sparrows are going to be the ones that you'll see most commonly. Okay. I think that I think that does it for questions. Great. So I think Jens will take over now. Uh, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Doug. That was really, uh, really awesome. I uh, very much appreciated that and learned a lot. Um, so, um, 
I, uh, so this is a part of the Community Wildlife Program's webinar series, and we're, we were, we're very anxious to connect the dots uh, between parts of the department and, and make sure that, that all the parts understand, uh, you know, that, that the audience understands all the, the different work that's going on. Um, Lincoln and I staff the Community Wildlife Program, and we do uh, municipal technical assistance. So we serve all 268 Vermont municipalities and 11 regional planning commissions. Um, we do a lot of night meetings, uh, and uh, and it's great work. It it helps us interact with with amazing folks like yourselves, uh, uh, really across the state. So um, just wanted to put in a plug here for that. Our our services are free to you. Uh, we do put on presentations and workshops, a webinar series in the spring and the fall. We also do in person uh, presentations in towns across the state. On, uh, uh, on Friday, we're presenting at the Agency of Natural Resources Municipal Day. Uh, we presented at ABCC's Conservation Summit, that kind of thing. We also do direct technical assistance, helping with town plan updates, zoning rewrites, all of that sort of thing. Um, so just wanted to give you a, a little bit of sense of, of where, where you know, a different part of the department is coming from um, and how we can serve you in, in your work with your town commission. Now, one of the exciting things that we do uh, is every 10 years, uh, the department works with partners to do a review of every single town plan, zoning code, subdivision ordinance, uh, every bylaw in the state with respect to uh, fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, we just completed our, our third round of looking at every town plans. Uh, and uh, and it's it's been really fascinating to understand both uh, what's in the town plans, those sorts of aspirational goals, uh, visions for what a town can look like, and and specifically how they incorporate different natural resource issues like grassland bird habitat. Um, so in this most recent review from 2020 to 2021, and, and sorry I didn't pull the 2011 numbers. But in, in the 2021 review, 43 plans, uh, town plans, mention grasslands and grassland bird habitat as, uh, as important habitat. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a surprising number, actually, given the, uh, given the sort of trend towards brevity in town plans. Uh, so a lot of times towns are cutting the natural resource section and getting rid of some of the detail. Um, so it's great that that many town plans still mention grassland bird habitat uh, and, and speak to its importance. Um, and I just wanted to show you, sorry, this next slide is going to be a little texty, but I just wanted to give you one example from Dummerston. Uh, and I'll show you on the map at right shows you that Dummerston is there in the uh, in the southeast uh, quadrant of Vermont in Wyndham County. Um, and just give you a sense of some of the language that Dummerston is using. Um, so they cite the Atlas of Breeding Birds and the potential breeding bird species that are there. Uh, they talk a bit about what species are common in Dummerston. Um, and, uh, and then they talk about how, you know, as Doug has said, most grasslands in town are managed for hay production, which often conflicts with the nesting of these species. So fields that are not mowed until after, in this case, they say July 15th, uh, allow these species to fledge their young. So uh, at the very least, these towns that are mentioning the resource are, are making people aware of it in the planning process. They're saying that these habitats are important to towns. They're giving the towns people that read the plans a, a sense of, of what type of management might be helpful and, and, and um, and how to, to take that to the next level. So, uh, so that's, that's something, uh, at least, to report out in terms of what's happening at the town level. As we look towards the zoning and subdivision, the, the regulatory side of things, uh, there's very little. Uh, this is a, a very difficult resource to regulate at the town level. Uh, as Doug said, it's inherently ephemeral. Um, and so particularly with municipal regulations, it's very difficult to uh, to, to regulate. Uh, and um, and, you know, at the local level, those are, are, are very contentious issues. 
So uh, we haven't found any uh, regulation per se at that municipal level related to uh, grassland bird or grassland bird habitat. But I did want to give you an example at the town level. Um, the town of Charlotte uh, has a significant wildlife habitat map that they make available to uh, to developers. It's in on the town website. And the Town Conservation Commission uh, really relies on this significant wildlife habitat map for uh, for as the basis of their review. So in this case, the Conservation Commission is involved in the regulatory review process. Uh, that isn't the case in most towns in Vermont, um, but they, they, it's certainly allowed. Conservation commissions have an advisory role uh, and, and, can, uh, and can choose to uh, submit their feedback to the Development Review Board or, or whatever the regulatory structure is in that town. And so specifically, the significant wildlife habitat map um, uh, puts these uh, these persistent shrubland habitats out there uh, as a, as a resource worth protecting and and flags them. So developers can look at the significant wildlife habitat map before uh, discussions begin about a proposed development. And at the very least, there'll be transparency in terms of what resources are going to come up in the development review process. And then the, the map allows the, uh, the Conservation Commission to then weigh in. Now, uh, this map was created uh, with some outside help um, from um, Matt Colin and Jesse Moore. It's based on inventory work that uh, happened over many years in Charlotte. Um, and so there was a great deal of work that went into it, but that sort of regulatory predictability, uh, I think, is is really worth the time. Um, so you know, not only having inventories that include grassland bird habitat, but making sure that those inventories are available to the town, that they're out there on the town website, and and that you can use them to both celebrate resources across your town and off and, and also offer some regulatory predictability in terms of here are the resources we care about. When you propose development in these resources, it's it's going to be an issue that we're going to need to talk about back and forth. Um, so that's one example of how grassland birds work their way into the town development review process. Um, but that's really all we've found so far. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. I, I do encourage you to look at that. Um, Lincoln and I are certainly available to talk more about inventory, how to do it, how to uh, how to pay for it, and also um, you know how to make sure it's usable and that it's not just science that sits on the shelf, but that it actually has a role in your your town planning process and even the development review process. So on Friday at a and Municipal Day, we're doing a session on National Resource Inventory um, that is in person in Montpelier uh, and National Life. Uh, and so you're, you're welcome to attend. We'd, we'd love to have you. OK, um, I just wanted to close out with uh, the acknowledgement that, that really it's overwhelmingly hunters and anglers that pay for conservation in Vermont uh, and that everyone can participate in paying for conservation. Uh, by purchasing a, a habitat stamp, and no, that's not a postal sta a postage stamp. Uh, it's more like a bumper sticker. But um, all of the money that goes into the habitat stamp fund is used by the department to actually purchase habitats, uh, and so that's an incredible opportunity to lend your financial support. Another way is through the non-game wildlife fund, and so we we really encourage uh, donations so that everyone can get involved in in supporting conservation. And with that, let's bring uh, today's webinar to a close. Thank you all so very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's great to have you with us and, and, uh, and to be able to offer this kind of programming. We have plenty of times for questions, and I, I know most of those are for Doug. So I'm just going to um, close out my slideshow and uh, the screen sharing and uh, turn it back over to Lincoln and Doug. Okay, so uh, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, just some thanks. But um, if you do have a question, pop it in there or or feel free to unmute yourself and, and say it out loud.
I'm also curious if anyone with guest beside their name has been unable to answer, to actually access the chat. Uh, we've been having a little bit of a problem with Teams recently, uh, and I'm just curious if, if that is happening to folks. If you could unmute your mic and let me know if that's happened, uh, that would also be important feedback for us. Well, Doug, sounds like you did a great job answering questions, my friend. I, I'm uh, so comprehensive. I covered everything. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, again, uh, Doug, thank you. It's a real pleasure to, to have you with us today and, and to be able to make these connections. Um, and to all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we actually, the winner of today's distance uh, joining is Marilyn, who's coming from uh, uh, Calgary. Uh, so uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in uh, and thanks to uh, folks more locally uh, for tuning in. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone.